So for right now, what we want to do is talk about um, essentially how do you go about detecting and either flagging or fixing geographic errors in your data. <coughs> and so when we talk about big data sets, this is how big they can be, okay? That's five, 526 million records, and that's a heat map of their distribution across the surface of the Earth. And what you're seeing when you look at the white areas are, for example, places that have been extremely good at organizing their biodiversity data. I'm pointing at Australia, South Africa, Mexico. Um, there are places that have lots of biodiversity scientists, so Europe, North America. So there's all sorts of things that go into <coughs> making this map light up where it has lit up. Okay, but each little point of light that you see is one or ten or a thousand or even a million biodiversity records that coincide with that latitude and longitude. So there are obvious errors, like if I have a latitude of 95, you're going to tell me, Alan, there's something wrong with that data point, right? Um, <coughs> but we need to go deeper than that. So we've talked about detecting errors. Ideally, we correct them. But at the very least, we want to put a signal on them, OK, that this may have a problem. And wherever possible, we want to be able to provide a measure of confidence. OK, we've already <coughs> talked about all of that, so I won't go into any detail. So let's go through two examples. And I think these two examples give us some, some good basis for, for learning. So I took this Taraco. And I had to do a little bit of playing with taxonomic uh, problems, but that's, that's Arturo's realm, not mine. So let's go straight to the geographic, OK? Now, if you sit back in the back of the room, you know, if Moses is looking at this map, where is this species? Okay. Easy answer, sub-Saharan Africa, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we've got to deal with a couple of problems, like that and that, but really this is sub-Saharan Africa. <coughs> now, maybe the species is very mobile or gets lost every so often and showed up in Chicago and New Mexico or um, Alexandria. Or maybe not. So that's why we do these exercises. Data points that look strange may be wrong, or they, must, they may just be peripheral or extreme. So first, let's look internally. And remember this exercise of asking whether the latitude-longitude coordinates fall <coughs> in the country that the data set specifies. So focusing on this point up here, I go to the data record and look at the country, South Africa, OK? Can anybody guess what happened? Negative Right, in latitude. So indeed, if you reflect this over the equator, which is right here, you come to there, OK? And that's an error where we have a couple good reasons to correct it, OK? It's a very common error where people miss that negative sign. And the data record is telling us South Africa. It's not saying Egypt. So that's an easy one. Then let's look at this one. This is a very interesting one. A point that falls, sorry, Zaire, Democratic Republic of the Congo. But in the data record, it says Sudan. So it's certainly not an issue of wrong hemisphere. Rather, we're just off by a little bit. Now, sometimes you get a data point that's really in uh, Sudan, 
but it appears to be in the wrong country because of the complexity or simplicity of the boundary. Okay, so that'll happen, but that's not the case here either. We've got some kilometers in there. So I went back to the data record, and here it is, two field museum specimens. And it's very interesting, if you look at the latitude and longitude, there's a couple decimal points of precision on the longitude and no precision on the latitude. <coughs> so probably either this is a typographic error or there was some rounding, but something happened. And actually the next example I show you will be from the same institution and same error. So here is a data point that uh, from the data record should be in Burundi, but shows up in Rwanda when you plot it out on the map. And again, you go back to the data record and look at that same thing, zero precision, zero decimal places in the latitude. <coughs> so this is something particular to a single institution. I don't mean to be picking on the Field Museum. I did my PhD there and I, I used to work there as a curator. Um, but there's something in its data set that is leading to zero precision uh, data records in their latitude and longitude. We probably can't fix that without going back to where in Burundi. So if we can't fix it, we flag it. Right? We put a, a red flag over it. So now let's go extrinsic. Here's some more information on this Taraco. And we have a good description of its range. But notice it's Natal to Western Zululand, Swaziland, Cape Province, Transvaal, and Swaziland. I thought we said Sub-Saharan Africa, didn't we? So right away, the easy ones are we can say, no, those points are not in its range. But also, we have to deal with the fact that this taxon <coughs> actually constitutes a complex. Those are just the three closest relatives. But older concepts of this taxon name applied to a broader complex across all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we need to deal with all of these in terms of what do they refer to. But certainly in terms, sorry, in terms of corresponding either to this particular name or to the broader, what used to be called a superspecies, the broader complex of species, all of these in red represent potential problems. Okay? That's a quarter of the data set, by the way. Yeah. And then even after we've dealt with kind of the, the coarse grain range of southern Africa, even then we can look at the land cover type. So these are external data sets. Okay? But we look at the points for this species within the species known range and what we see is that this species tends to be in closed deciduous forest but then we have all of these other things some of them make perfect sense deciduous woodland instead of closed deciduous forest that's probably fine <coughs> but we have a few in there that make me worry montane forest croplands and those may represent either wrong georeferences, or they could also represent old specimens that were indeed collected in deciduous forest, but in the time between when they were collected and when this map was made, the land use changed. Right? Very, very common, unfortunately, which is to say in the last half century or century, huge amounts of natural habitat have been transformed into cropland or grazing areas or what have you. So 
That's not necessarily a problem, but those are certainly records that we might want to look at. Okay. And then we can look at them in terms of environment as well. Those are maps of temperature and precipitation across southern Africa. And then, just for illustration, I graphed annual mean temperature against annual precipitation. <coughs> and I looked at the extreme high values of precipitation, the extreme low values of precipitation, and the extreme high values of temperature. And again, these are not necessarily wrong. Even if our data were perfect, there has to be some observation that has the highest value of temperature and the highest value of precipitation. But these are values that we might want to look at. Okay, these are data records that place the species <coughs> under a curious or different environmental circumstance. And we want to figure out whether the niche of this species with respect to these two dimensions looks like this or whether it looks like this. And so we can add some confidence to that difference by checking these points. And if there's a lot of uncertainty in their georeferencing, maybe we should, you know, we should think about whether we want to include a point that is surprising environmentally and not very certain in terms of its problems. <coughs> okay. So that was kind of a single species example. Um, and you notice that some of the problem data points we would uh, correct, like the, the, the Egyptian um, occurrence. And some of the problem ones we would signal as definitely having a problem, like those very imprecise records from the Field Museum. And then some we just would take another look at and just make sure that they're not problems. Okay? But now, to give you a second example that's probably closer to what we're doing in this course, I'm going to go back to an example that actually I developed for the Ghana course, uh, looking at the data from the University of Ghana Herbarium. And I want to start by saying, there is nothing unique about this data set in the sense that every single one of the data sets represented around the table have the same sort of problems. Okay? Um, so, I'm just using this as an example, but it's, it's a, a useful example. And this, <coughs> this procedure really requires a lot of playing with your data and exploring your data and I think this example illustrates that very nicely. So it started with 65,000 records, oh. <laughs> 33,000 had um, latitude longitudes in the correct hemispheres, but everything from the southern hemisphere I put a negative sign in front of, and everything from the Western Hemisphere, I put a negative sign in front of. <coughs> okay? And so this was essentially playing, I did this in Excel. You, know, you can do this sort of stuff probably more uh, efficiently in Refine, and so some of our previous courses have, have given instruction with Refine, and that's great, but Excel does a lot of the job. So notice that for north versus south southern hemisphere, we have values of 0, 1, 2, B, E, K, W, and north and south. Okay? Very calm. And for eastern versus western hemisphere, we have east and west and north and south. Okay? Now, if you're setting out to capture data, this is a matter for another course, ideally what you're going to do is to set up your data capture such that for north versus south hemisphere, there are only <coughs> two possible values. 
That's now much easier to do with some of the new capture platforms, but we can give fields what's called a controlled vocabulary so that they can only take on these values. So when I put those data into a GIS, this is what I got. <laughs> okay? And so pretty clearly what we've got are just some values that are off the map. That might be, for example, you know, 12 degrees north with some minutes and seconds, but I don't put the decimal point in there. And so it looks like 12,000 degrees north, <laughs> right? Again, this happens every time I looked at a data set. And so every single one of the data sets that we're gonna talk about this afternoon, I went through the same procedure, okay? Now we go into Ghana and we get this. Again, this is, this is stuff that's common. This is just kind of coming in towards, um, towards Ghana. I noticed, oops, I've got some data in Ethiopia. I thought about could that be in the wrong hemisphere? No. Those are data in the Ghana herbarium that are from Ethiopia. I assume somebody traded or somebody visited or something. Um, but then I got this pattern. You see those little splotches of data. And so that was making me worry a little bit. Um, that took me some thinking. If anybody who wasn't in Ghana can figure this out, you win the prize. I don't know what the prize is. <laughs> I'll give you a, a clue. Um, we usually use a decimal place, a decimal point to indicate the break between ones and tenths. But if you use it to indicate the break between degrees and minutes, remember that minutes can only go up to 59. And so I'm guessing that this is <coughs> zero minutes. This is 60 minutes. And then I get nothing because these aren't decimals, but they look like decimals. So I kind of figured out what was going on. And see, here's, the, here's what the data look like. It says degrees, minutes, like here. So instead of reading this as 5.39, I had to read it as 5 degrees and 39 minutes. Okay? And that's what the data looked like afterwards. Okay, suddenly a lot better. We're not all the way there, but, but pretty much there. So once I interpreted degrees and minutes correctly, instead of as degrees and decimals, I still had this problem, but now I could think about it better. <coughs> I came into Africa, and this is looking more like what I wanted to see because, okay, you've got some specimens from across West Africa. Most of them are on land. I like that. Um, I think I asked Alex if he had specimens from Ethiopia in his collection. He said yes. And I still didn't know what to do with this, but I don't think I ever resolved that. Those, I don't know if they're marine plants or, <laughs> or error. <laughs> no worries. So the next thing I did was I simply put a different symbol on each point by the country that it was associated with in the textual description. And so, you know, here's Cameroon. And look at that, those yellow stars are basically in Cameroon, in the Gulf of Guinea, or down here in the wrong country. But almost all of them are right there. And almost all of the Nigerian points are in Nigeria. And then there were some problems. So notice, um, let's see what's a good example. Here is a Cameroon point that's definitely in the wrong country. Okay, and so anywhere where you see multiple symbols within the confines of <coughs> one country, that's a problem. That's an internal test for consistency. The coordinates say one thing, and the country name says another. It may be that the country name is right and the coordinates are wrong, or it may be that the coordinates are right and the country name is wrong. Without a little bit more research, that's hard to tell. 
But I can certainly take you know, this point and this point, or these three crosses and whatever that is yellow, or these Nigerian points, and with a fair amount of confidence, I can say, there's a problem here. Okay? And then we can do the same thing at a lower geographic level. <coughs> now I took states within Ghana, and I colored each one a particular symbol. And you can see there are some that are almost, almost fine. Just that one error in there, or that one uh, suspected error in there. And then there are some that are a bigger problem, like, like this one where I see its points way out there. Okay? This was an example that I developed one night in Ghana, and I think it was an all-night <coughs> task, but it was, it was fun and I got results that I enjoyed. <coughs> so you can, you can zoom in and you can see, yeah, this, this state is mostly these crosses, and then we've got a few that have leaked in from the state to the north, or this state. Okay, but all of those mismatches are things we want to look at. I still don't know whether they're right or wrong, but we want to look at them. And for example, using that process, I sent a bunch of challenges to Jean Ganglo, and he came back and he said, you know, we changed the names of our, a lot of our states, and it's, it's correct. And that was fine, because you look, you make sure it's consistent, and you move on. So, we can go back to our, our, uh, our previous example. And we can think about now what do we do? Okay? We know that a bunch of these are problems. And again, as I mentioned to you, in some cases we can very easily correct it. And when we can, we do that. And then what do we do? What's the final crucial step? I talked about it, Arturo talked about it. You document how you change the data record. And you always keep the original. Okay? So if it's, if it's a data set that you are developing for your own research, you might put original country as one field, South Africa, and then corrected country. Okay? In this case it doesn't change, but in others it will. And you might have original decimal latitude and longitude and corrected decimal latitude and longitude. And this one would change from positive 30 to negative 30. So we always keep the original information and we always document what we did and why. So coming back to Ghana, there was one thing that I kept looking at. What is happening right about here? <coughs> Nobody... Alex, I know you didn't. <laughs> what, what global phenomenon happens right here? Prime meridian? Right? So that's longitude zero. And so remember those problems of east, west, north, south. I was looking at this set of points here that should be over here, and I was thinking, why are they kind of uniformly out to there but no farther? So I thought about Eastern versus Western Hemisphere. So that's what those Volta localities look like. And I started looking at them and I noticed that they kind of came out farther on this side than here. And so guess what I did for those which are in the Western Hemisphere, I tried changing their longitude and latitude to Eastern Hemisphere, and guess what? Almost all of them looked a lot better. Now was I right in doing that? I don't know. But if I keep the original, and if I tell what I did, I can't be wrong. I made assumptions, and I wrote them down. I'm not wrong. But was I right? I don't know. <coughs> but that's an example of how 
using your head and playing with the data. Sometimes you can rescue huge amounts of data, okay, or very valuable data. So, as we've talked about all today, there are lots of biodiversity data and they have lots of problems. In fact, every problem that can exist either already does or will soon. Outdated taxonomy, bad georeferences, inconsistent ideas about what is a locality, etc., etc. You really have to get into the game of playing with your data. Playing with any data. Just recently, for a, an issue in the community where I live, some people needed maps of grocery stores in Lawrence, Kansas. And so I downloaded our census data, and I georeferenced all the grocery stores, and I actually had a lot of fun, because it's just playing with data. But you have to build in data cleaning, okay? And we're gonna repeat that and repeat that, um, but that's a picture of how to deal with geographic data. What's the technique? Play. What do you do? Visualize. And how do you fix it? Think. So it's not very high tech. For geographic data, it helps to be able to use a GIS program. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're really desperate, you can do a two-dimensional plot in Excel and you know, plot latitude versus longitude, and you have a very, very primitive GIS, right? So again, this is all about playing. Any questions about geographic data? <coughs> 